Hello everyone, Happy New Year and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Stephen Roth and I'm a board certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist. And in today's video, I'll be diving into some biopsy basics and we'll be discussing what areas to biopsy in certain circumstances. But first, we have to get into that disclaimer and that is that all opinions expressed in this video are mine and mine alone and do not represent any organization that may employ me or that I may belong to and that this video is for educational purposes only and should not serve as medical advice. Should you have any concerns about your oral or systemic health care, please see your nearest oral or systemic health care provider. And with that being said, let's get into today's video. First things first, biopsy selection is definitely subjective and there are a lot of right answers, so it's okay to have a different opinion. This video just goes over my thought process when I biopsy in certain clinical scenarios. If you want to toggle back and forth between the different clinical scenarios, you can use the chapters tool below. The first scenario is the easiest. This is the small benign appearing lump like this fibroma. The best approach here is an excisional biopsy or removing the entire lesion. You can just grab the lesion at the base and excise it entirely. A similar lesion on the gingiva is essentially the same concept. You'll excise the lesion down to the bone, and then I like to curette the surrounding tissue between the teeth. And the reason why I do that is to try to prevent recurrence. The next scenario is the large lump that would require a major surgery to remove fully, like this pleomorphic adenoma. Removing the entire lesion may be difficult on biopsy, or alternatively, perhaps we want to rule out a malignancy. We want to leave behind some of the lesion if we're worried about that malignancy so that the surgeon treating it has an easier time removing the tumor. If we remove all of the clinically evident malignancy, it can be difficult for that surgeon to determine the margins and may affect the patient's prognosis after surgery. I like to approach incisional biopsies of these lesions like a pie. We go all the way down to the base and cut out a slice for evaluation just like this. The next scenario is the ulcer. When you're biopsying an ulcer, you want to include the edge of the lesion. Biopsying just the ulcer membrane can make for a very difficult read under the microscope. It's often nonspecific and we only see the ulcer membrane. By taking a wedge, including normal tissue, ulcer border, and ulcer membrane, you're increasing your likelihood of obtaining diagnostic material. If you want to learn more about the differential diagnosis for a non-healing ulcer and what should be entering your brain when you see these lesions, check out the video above. Next, we have the vesicular ulcerative or erosive conditions. For these conditions, we will want to take perilesional tissue. This is tissue right next to the involved site. These conditions result in very fragile mucosa, so biopsying affected areas often results in the tissue just falling apart on biopsy. I think it's best to biopsy the most accessible areas to allow for the most diagnostic tissue. In this patient with suspected pemphigus vulgaris and multiple sites, I biopsied the lower labial mucosa. That's because the lower lip is extremely accessible and easy to see. Anterior buccal mucosa and anterior lateral tongue are also reasonable sites, though I will warn you that tongue biopsies are often usually more uncomfortable for the patient. In the case of a disquamative gingivitis, this can be very difficult to get that perilesional tissue. For these, I found that it's usually best to take a sample from the vestibule between the alveolar bone that holds the teeth and the cheek or lip. This will definitely result in perilesional tissue, but can be difficult to close primarily with sutures. Oftentimes for biopsies of vesiculoerosive conditions, I will split my biopsy in half, and half of the tissue will go in buffered formalin, and the other half will go in Michelle's solution for direct immunofluorescence studies. When submitting mucosal tissue where I'm most concerned about what's going on at the surface, I find that it's best to lay my biopsy on a firm, flat surface, like the edge of my cervical drape, or even better, a piece of cardboard from my suture packaging. The formalin fixative can cause the tissue to curl and deform, 
And this method of laying it on something flat will prevent that from happening and make it easier for us to see a nice layer at the top of that tissue. The next set of lesions is the leukoplakia or white patch. This is where things get a little controversial. One camp likes a biopsy to include normal tissue. And I agree that by including normal tissue, it's easier to see the transition of normal to abnormal under the microscope. However, I believe that it's better to diagnose the most concerning areas. A leukoplakia is not always homogenous throughout, and there may be varying degrees of dysplasia or precancerous change within it. You can combat this concept by taking multiple biopsies, but one of these biopsies must include the most concerning areas where the leukoplakia is thicker, or the underlying connective tissue appears form, or areas where there is redness or erythroleukoplakia. Erythroleukoplakias are usually where the lesion is of highest grade. Ultimately, there are multiple ways to approach biopsying these white patches, and the only wrong way to biopsy a leukoplakia is by ignoring it and not biopsying it at all. Like biopsies of vesiculoerosive condition, biopsies of leukoplakias are best kept flat so that the top and bottom are easily oriented when put into the tissue block and cut on a slide. Finally, we have the big nasty looking lesions. Here again, we wanna take the worst looking areas. For instance, in this suspected melanoma, I took the darkest area using a punch biopsy. As an aside, I find that punch biopsies work very well for gingival and palatal lesions. In this biopsy of a concerning lesion, you can take pretty much anywhere, but it would be best to avoid the necrotic area, which often looks like a white, yellow, liquefied area. If you want to find out what this lesion was, check out the video where I described this very peculiar case. So there you have it. Some clinical scenarios that require biopsy and how I would approach them. Obviously, each situation in each lesion is different and requires a different approach, but hopefully this will give you some insight as to how I approach biopsy in different lesions. If you're interested in sending your biopsies to our lab, reach out to the email below and we provide biopsy kits at no cost to you. Thanks for watching this video. I uh, plan to make a new series of biopsy basics that you won't want to miss, so be sure to subscribe. Also, please feel free to share this video with someone that may find it helpful as well. It really helps this small channel continue to grow. Thanks again for watching and be well.